Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Lipovsky, and I work as a malware researcher in uh, ESET's Virus Lab in Bratislava. Today, we'll be speaking about banking Trojans. Uh, now, as we, as we all know, uh, malware today is about stealing money. That's, that's a well-known fact. And there are actually, actually different ways uh, how the attackers can steal the money from the victims, from uh, less obvious ways, such as various shady advertising campaigns, collecting the users, uh, browsing habits, tar delivering targeted apps, and making money like this indirectly, or uh, the range varies. And, and the example of uh, banking Trojans, it's a more s much more straightforward approach where they would directly rob the user uh, and target his uh, online banking system or payment system, whatever. So uh, this is today's agenda. These are the malware families that I'll be mainly focusing on. And uh, I'll be showing a technical analysis of, uh, of uh, some of the features, some of the more interesting features uh, that, I, that I would like to point out uh, that, ca that caught our, our interest. Hopefully, hopefully not too boring. Uh, then I'll add uh, some statistical mm, data about the pre prevalence and about the distribution uh, of the malware. And during the course of the presentation, I think it'll become obvious uh, why it's important to deal with this stuff and why these malware families are significant. So uh, without further ado, let's get to it. And as an introduction, I think uh, I, I put this slide about Zeus and SpyEye. Now, I won't be focusing on these because there's been so much said about these. And they've been around uh, for some quite so for quite some time. Uh, so only for the sake of completeness, some well-known facts. Uh, these two malware families were rivals at first. Uh, then the Zeus uh, source code were uh, sold. Probably the author stopped development, and there's been some something like a merger between these two families. And uh, these malware, these banking Trojans, they use the common. Uh, common techniques of uh, man in the browser attacks. Uh, then, when banks added the second factor authentication, like uh, MTANs, uh, SMS messages, uh, they reacted with using man in the mobile techniques, where, which, uh, where mobile malware would be forwarding the security messages to the attackers. And uh, variants of these were targeting uh, Symbian, BlackBerry, and Android platform as well. Uh, so, this is, this is a screenshot from an old. Uh, SpyEye bot builder over here, you can even see the option to uninstall Zeus on an, on an infected machine. And uh, even, though, even though Zeus and SpyEye aren't that hot anymore, uh, they're certainly still active. They're still active, they're prevalent. This is a screenshot from not, not such a long time ago. And it reads, it, it, we found this in a packer, in a custom packer for Zeus. And it says, hey, hey not, not 32 guys, your last work was very good. I was really surprised. I spent over four hours trying to fix these detections, but their better man still stands. Come along, little doggy, come along. <laughs> I mean, come on, the better man still stands. Okay, whatever. It was quite funny finding this message in the, uh, in the malware. But as I was saying, uh, this, this malware uh, is still out there. Uh, it's still, still robbing users. And uh, before I... Before I continue, uh, I added some, some statistics of the distribution of uh, Zeus and SpyEye. Uh, now, the big, big uh, purple uh, sector, that's rest of the world. And these ones are Turkey, Spain, Italy, Argentina. Uh, for SpyEye, it's quite similar to Zeus. And as you can see, the distribution is, uh, is pretty global. It's uh, pretty spread all over the world, which, which will not be the case in the in the main in the examples that I'll be focusing on later uh, as those will be targeting mostly Russian speaking countries and also originating uh, from Russian speaking countries so let's talk about uh, RDP door RDP door an interesting uh, piece of malware uh, first samples were detected in 2010 and the way it works is that uh, it uses a remote desktop to, to uh, enable the attacker to log into the victim's machine. And the attack is pretty, pretty manual, so uh, 
this uh, this backdoor will enable the attacker to uh, connect to the victim, and then we'll he will literally have to watch over his shoulder and uh, wait uh, for him to connect and to enter some credentials and then uh, misuse those. Uh, for for that, uh, this malware uses uh, components of legitimate software called ThinSoft Thin Btwin. And it also uses some pretty pretty neat, interesting techniques for bypassing some security mechanisms. It d has some techniques for avoiding AV detection. And for the cost of $2,000, you would basically be getting a bot builder and access to an administrative uh, panel. And uh, basically, th that's that's the price. You, c you can pretty much buy this malware on under underground black forums. And that's 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 the way that modern malware works today. It, the criminals using it for stealing aren't necessarily the same ones behi uh, behind programming, and it's the it's the whole scheme of uh, organized crime. Now, statistics, as I was mentioning, uh, the big blue part is Russia, followed by Ukraine and Kazakhstan, and th and this graph will be similar uh, with uh, all the, all the other examples. And the reason why these, uh, these bad guys are targeting these countries with this malware is that they actually have uh, quite similar banking systems, so they're able uh, to target all of these regions at the same time with the same, same software. Okay, let's take a little look uh, under the hood how this works. Uh, the installation of RDP door is pretty simple. Uh, the, when the dropper is run on the affected computer, it will send some uh, system inf information to the uh, command and control center, and then the command and control server will authenticate uh, the infection and provide the between uh, software for installation. So this is what it looks like. That's the URL up there. There's some bot ID that's being sent, uh, information about the system, Windows version and service pack, whether it's a standard user account or an administrator account. Then the response, uh, there's a standardized uh, protocol uh, which RDP door is using, starting with this web tag and then there is an R command uh, which is basically sending uh, sending the components of the Btwin software uh, to the infected computer. And then uh, then, the, then the client will respond with status information whether the installation was successful or not and right there it says that every, everything went okay. Okay I have a little demo showing you how uh, the attackers actually uh, steal the login information uh, for the computer, and this is this is how it works. It's installing an extension of uh, Gina, graphi graph graphical uh, authentication. So we infected the uh, machine on a virtual replicator. Uh, that's the sample that was run, rdpdoor.aa. Now we're, we're checking in uh, Regedit uh, whether the appropriate uh, registry entry was made for the GINA extension. And there it is, GINA DLL is showing to xtgina.dll, which is the extension uh, dropped by the malware. And once, that once, once that's installed, we'll restart the system. We'll s fire up uh, Wireshark on the host so we can see what it's uh, sending out, what's, what it's communicating. Enter the password username and is, is administrator. Password is password. Switch back to Wireshark and wait for it moment of surprise and there it is username administrator and the password followed by the computer name and the fact that it's an administrator account so using this simple yet effective technique, the attackers are able to get the login cred credentials of the victim and then using the between 
uh, components, they will remotely connect uh, to the computer. And uh, the advantage of using this between, between software is that, uh, is that uh, the user will not actually be logged out of his session. So he, they will literally be watching over his shoulder and waiting for him uh, to access his bank. Uh, this, these are some of the commands uh, from the protocol that RDP door is using. Uh, the most more interesting ones, remember R, that was from the installation uh, used over there. Uh, then T uh, is for between back connection initialization. Uh, what that functionality enables uh, RDP door uh, to deal with NAT. And then the U command uh, is used for updating the modules of the malware. So with uh, the U command, uh, a new dropper with a new configuration embedded inside will be provided. Fairly simple malware, but uh, quite effective, actually. Uh, Sheldor is something similar. Uh, the price on the black market is, is also quite similar. Uh, it is the MO of uh, Sheldor and uh, RDP door are is uh, pretty much the same. The attacker will be uh, trying trying to uh, connect to the victim uh, through with remote access, but it doesn't use between uh, software. This time it uses TeamViewer, uh, which is again a legitimate application. And the and the the advantage of using a legitimate application that is signed. Uh, one advantage is that uh, it it is able to avoid suspicion. It is uh, signed components, so it uh, at first glance appears pretty legitimate. And the second, ap second advantage is that uh, using TeamViewer adds another level of anonymity since it's a cloud-based service. Statistics, again, quite similar to before. Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan. This illustration actually shows uh, how the TeamViewer uh, connections work. So first, uh, the infected uh, host, the infected bot, would con contact the TeamViewer cloud, requ request the cloud ID. Uh, the cloud uh, would reply. Uh, then this uh, ID will be set on the client, and then, uh, due to the infected uh, bi the infected binary will uh, the malicious binary will connect to the shell or CNC and send uh, the team viewer credentials to the attacker. And once he has that, uh, there's nothing standing in his way to connect to the computer via the team viewer infrastructure. Uh, taking li taking a little look uh, under the hood, uh, these are the components, uh, the legitimate ones. Th that's the TeamViewer XE and TeamViewer uh, DLL. Uh, what the malware puts in place is a it's a TV DLL, which acts as a proxy DLL. Uh, basically, it does some simple uh, DLL hooking, and uh, this is what it uh, looks like inside the DLL. Uh, these are the functions of the DLL that are being hooked. This is where the original TSDLL is loaded. Uh, the function hooks are installed. Down here, you can even see uh, the command and control URL. Uh, these are the bot bo commands that uh, Shelter is using. There's, there's the, the ability to download and execute additional modules, thus greatly expanding uh, the functionality, the capabilities of the malware. Uh, there's a kill feature to delete all the files to hide its tracks and stuff like that. And uh, as I said, uh, well, this malware is not only for uh, technically skilled people. Uh, any, anyone, any criminal basically is able to buy this and uh, do crime using these tools. So this is a screenshot from more of a user perspective uh, of this malware. Uh, this was taken after uh, a takedown of one of the, one of the CNCs. And what you can see here are the different banks uh, which, the, uh, which the malware is targeting. There's a Russian bank, iBank, BSS, PSB, Bear, et cetera, et cetera. OK, and Carburp. Carburp, uh, unlike uh, the previous two examples, is slightly more sophisticated. And the price tag also uh, confirms that. It's, uh, it's more expensive. And so for this price, what will, what will the client, the criminal, be getting? Uh, he's, he's again getting an access to a bot builder, to an administrative panel. And uh, this, this malware, unlike the previous two examples, 
works differently. This is a much more sophisticated and advanced malware. Uh, it's modulized. There are plugins for it, plugins which are targeted directly at specific banks. And uh, depending on the, mo on the modules, the plugins that you're buying, uh, the price will depend on that. And also uh, the amount and the level of support. That's right. These uh, people are, are also providing support uh, for this malware, uh, technical support, and also stuff like they will provide you a new variant once uh, this uh, bot is being detected by AV engines and stuff like that. So, uh, and another another important uh, fact about Carburp is that it's not it's also sold on underground forums, but it's not sold to everyone. So it's a more closed circle. Uh, as I was said, it's uh, customizable to target specific banks, and the way it works, similarly like uh, Zeus and SpyEye, is that it's using man-in-the-browser techniques. So uh, it installs uh, the DLLs, injects DLLs into Internet Explorer and Firefox, and it's, it is really a Grand Theft Trojan. There are real-world incidents uh, where the usage of Carburp uh, was proven, and these are cases where millions of dollars were stolen. So statistics, uh, there are two pie charts uh, this time. The last time I did a presentation on Carburp, uh, this is the chart I used, and again, Russia is in the first place, followed by Ukraine. But the point I was making is that this time, uh, Carburp attackers are expanding and uh, attacking more globally. There's Ukraine is followed by Spain and then United States. So it's not only focusing on, on the Russian-speaking region. And then when I updated this graph for this presentation from April 2011 to present, it's still the same graph as we've seen before. Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, they're in fourth place. So previously I was saying that, okay, they're globalizing, they're broadening their horizon. Now what, they, they're going back? Well, the reason for this isn't actually that uh, they're pulling, pulling away from the global markets, but they're actually, the reason for that is not that there's less detections uh, in the USA of Carver, but there's much, much more detections in Russia, for example, this is the uh, these are the time statistics uh, for Russia. As as you can see, at this period of time, May and June of this year, it has increased rapidly. And the reasons for this is that several cyber criminal groups are behind uh, Carburp. So basically, more people have been working on this. More people have been using it. There were changes uh, in the in the people behind that. And these changes are quite visible during our analysis of the code as well. And on the bright side, though, uh, there, there have been also a few uh, successful takedowns of command and control uh, servers of uh, Carburp, which were coordinated by uh, Group IB, which is the main company uh, doing the investigations of uh, cybercrime in Russia, uh, assisted by the Russian police. And uh, the most visible uh, impact that it had on the, on the detections uh, is between November and December, where there was quite a dramatical uh, decline thanks to the takedown of a couple of uh, CNC servers. Okay, these are the bot commands that Carburp is using. To point out, point out uh, some of the more, more interesting ones, uh, there's the kill user option, which uh, is there to better cover uh, their tracks for the attackers, where the, uh, the whole window, Windows user account would be deleted and thus making forensic analysis a bit harder. And Carburp, as I said, it is, it is much more sophisticated than the previous two examples. It, it has some uh, pretty nice uh, self-protection mechanisms. Uh, it has techniques for by bypassing AV emulators, uh, such as doing many calls of uh, GUI APIs. And the code injection method has changed between these two versions of Carver before it was using the W resume thread. Uh, the later version was using the WQ APC thread. Uh, the later version also uh, was using an encryption algorithm for encrypting its commands and the strings inside the binary. Uh, it would do be a better job of authenticating uh, on the CNC. So it would be much harder to uh, infiltrate the botnet and carry out an investigation. And a couple of, couple of other uh, other tricks employed as well, some basic uh, rootkit techniques for hiding in the system, detecting the hooks uh, installed by AV engines and uninstalling them, uh, unhooking, 
and stuff like that. Now, as for the distribution, uh, the bad guys either handle it themselves, so they distribute directly where they basically they would only be paying for the traffic, or they would distribute via partners, uh, the typical paper install schemes, uh, partner ka affiliate programs, and the typical techniques for distributing malware were used, black hat S SEO, infected blogs, drive by, drive by downloads, and, uh, and instances where uh, the impact exploit pack was used were quite numerous as well. Okay, so here's, here's again a user, user's perspective uh, of, of the malware. Uh, this is a Carburb control panel. As you can see, we didn't come, we didn't come up with the name ourselves. Uh, the bad guys named it. And uh, to point out the, more, the interesting parts here, this prefix column, that's the affiliate ID. So the attacker will actually know who to pay in their paper install scheme. As you can see here, it's, there are a bunch of zeros in the live column. So this screenshot was taken after a takedown of the CNC server. And uh, here, there's, there's, the bot, there's the controls for controlling the individual bots. Uh, there's an option to execute commands and a remote shell, stuff like that. Here's the bank settings uh, of the control panel. The interesting fact here is that uh, some limits for the transa transactions can be made. So as uh, banks aren't suspicious if a large amount of money is withdrawn at, at, at a single, in a single transaction. And uh, over here, you can see the different banks that Carburb is targeting. And as targeting, as you can see, these aren't only Russian banks. There's HSBC of UK. There are uh, banks in the Netherlands, Israel, uh, German Sparkasse, uh, Latvian banks. So pretty global, pretty global targeting of Carburb. And uh, so after after those takedowns that I was mentioning, uh, we've we've seen all all the stolen data that was. Uh, that the attackers laid their hands on, and that was a lot of stolen data. This is this is screenshots of over 7,000 cab archives with sensitive user information, and inside them, uh, it it contained all the information that uh, that the attackers were interested in: uh, screenshots, loggings of banking credentials, key logs, and stuff like that for different different payment systems. This is Cyberplat, this is iBank, an internet banking client used by different banks. Another one. This is a Ukrainian bank. Okay, so let's con let's compare uh, the different stealing tools. As I said, these are these are basically weapons in the hands of criminals for stealing the victim's money. And uh, as you can s as as I said before, Carburp is the most technically advanced uh, out of all of these, and is also its horizon that it, the 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 scope that it's targeting the countries. It's uh, much wider. Uh, the functionality that it's using for remote access is different in all of these three. Uh, Carburp is uh, modulized, targeting specific banks, and over here, uh, the information stealing has to be done manually. The complexity of the, of the code uh, when a reverse engineering obviously is the most is the highest with Carburp, and the similarity between all of these is that they all form botnets. Okay, obviously these aren't the only uh, malware families. Uh, designated for this purpose. Uh, apart from all those that I've been mentioning, there's Shiz, there, which is uh, one of the first sophisticated uh, banking Trojans targeting banks in Russia. There's Spy Ranbius, Plat Cyber, which, as the name suggests, targets the Cyber Plat payment system, and IWIC, which is targeting the Kiwi payment system. Okay, and let's let's now move something a little bit different, yet very closely connected to all these. And that's hot prot. Statistics, again, pretty similar. Now, hot prot is a downloader, so it's 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 a tool which which cooperates with all these malware families that I was just mentioning. There were instances found where hot prot would be downloading RDP doll, Sheldor, Plat Cyber, Carburp, and others. And uh, it isn't it isn't a simple Trojan downloader either. It features some pretty interesting uh, techniques, uh, some anti-forensic uh, methods, and basically techniques which are uh, doing 
which are making our jobs more difficult. And it's been associated with real world incidents where a lot of money was stolen. But let's, let's take a closer look at the technical details of hot prod. So uh, the installation, it's, it starts becoming interesting from the very start. Unlike the simpler uh, banking Trojans, which would, after installation, first directly contact uh, the CNC, not only what it needs to download, update itself, etc. cetera. Uh, hot prod first penetrates the system, basically settles in before, before it starts doing its, all its dirty work. Uh, it consists of several modules. I'll, I'll describe each of them uh, in greater detail. It has some techniques for bypassing AVs and intrusion prevention systems. Uh, it's using the add print processor trick during the installation. Now, for those of you that are uh, following malware analysis, uh, probably know that uh, this isn't unique and this was inspired by some malware before. So who knows which malware that was? Check if you're not asleep yet. That's TDL, the famous uh, Olmaric or TDL rootkit, uh, which, uh, which is well known for using this trick. Uh, the driver, it uses an undocumented way or an, an uncommon way of uh, loading the driver by using the ZW set system information uh, native API with the system add driver uh, parameter, unlike the common way of installing drivers as registering them as a service. And the mo most interesting probably is that it stores its program code in the registry instead of files as on the disk. So clearly it's obvious that uh, the hot prod creators are following the trends of modern malware of rootkits because as you all know, uh, rootkits in the past, what they would do is that they would try to hide the processes on the system, the malicious processes on the system. They would hide the malicious files in the file system. Whereas modern rootkits, they would try to avoid this suspicious behavior, this hooking uh, that could give it, all, give it away and try, try to bypass files altogether, such as TDL, stores its data into ra in, in raw sectors in raw, as raw bytes uh, on at, at the end of the hard drive. Okay, so take a, let's take a look at uh, the installation steps uh, that are done, that are taken by HotProd. So first, a setup API DLL is dropped in the, in the directory of the browsers on the system. Uh, the malware uh, supports Internet Explorer, Opera, and Firefox. And following that, uh, the ad print processor technique is used uh, to load the module, and if that fails due to some uh, problems with admin rights, uh, the malware uh, escalates the privileges by using the MS-1015 vulnerability. If it succeeds, it will disable the Windows File Protection Service, and after that, it will replace the SFC files DLL and store the original file in the registry. I'll explain what the purpose of this is in just a second. Then it drops and loads the Melissa driver using that uncommon technique that I just mentioned. Then, it's, then it activates the whole payload after it's installed by opening up a default browser and navigating to google.com. Okay, so the code in the registry, the main, main binaries, the main code of the malware is stored in the registry like this. It's encrypted using uh, some custom XOR and rotation and stuff like that. And uh, these are the five, five registry keys that the malware is using. Core settings is used to store the main module, the main bot module uh, of the Trojan. In this key, the original SFC files DLL is stored. This one uh, is the binary, the kernel driver image. Over here is some loader code, which is used to load the main module. And then in the last one, hash seed, is where the malware stores its encrypted uh, CNC URLs. So to get, to get the whole picture, as you see, there are some different components in the malware. It might get a bit confusing. Uh, so so this, is, this is the code. This is the code stored uh, inside, inside the registry. There's the loader code. There's the main bot module. There are the CNC URLs. And plus, there are these two APIs, setup API DLL and SFC files DLL, and also the kernel driver. So what is all this for? What's, what's the purpose? What are, what, what's the infrastructure uh, implemented by this malware? So set up API DLL. As I said, that's the, that's the 
DLL that's dropped into the installation directories of the browsers on the system. Uh, interesting, interesting technique that it's using to inject this DLL into the browser's address space is called DLL hijacking. So uh, when, when this uh, browser process will be started, the Windows loader, what it would do is it would first check wh the the w whether the DLL is located in the present current directory where the uh, process image is starting, uh, is, yeah, is located. And if it's not there, it will search the path uh, environment variable and look for directories, directories listed there. So the, but the legitimate setup API DLL is in the system directory. So when the malware drops its, its uh, DLL into these directories, the malicious DLL will be loaded instead of the legitimate one. And the purpose of the DLL is to get into the browser's address space and to inject, uh, inject the main bot module from the registry that I was just showing before. SFC files DLL. Uh, that has to do with Windows file protection that I was mentioning during the installation phase that's being disabled. And uh, this gets onto the infected system by overriding uh, the legitimate uh, DLL and the original is stored in the registry. And uh, its purpose is uh, one, to be started uh, once, uh, once the operation operating system is started after reboot. And uh, to load the driver if it's not running. And it also also has the capability to update the software. Now the advantage of that is that it's loaded by WinLog on Exe, which is a trusted system process. And the driver, SFC Sys. Now what that is doing, its purpose is the same as with setup API DLL, to load the main bot module into the browser. Now as you can see, there is some duplicity in the functionality of these different modules which uh, shows how, uh, how much work the authors of Hotprod had put into their creation. And basically, they are creating backup mechanisms in case one, one of them fails and uh, making, making the malware much more difficult to remove from the infected system. So uh, what the driver, driver is doing is that it registers the load image notify routine uh, callback function uh, which gets triggered by the by the Windows loader uh, whenever an image, whenever a module is loaded, and then it checks whether one of the loaded modules is one of these, when in a DLL and so on, used by browsers, and if it if it is, then the browser injection takes place. Now, okay, so so there's there are quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of modules. So let's see how how this is interconnected. As I said, the heart of the Trojan. Uh, the main components are stored not as files, but in the registry that's over here. And the SFC files DLL, uh, which is residing in the WinLogon address space, uh, loaded by WinLogon during the startup uh, of the system, is able to update this payload and also make sure that the driver, the kernel driver, is loaded. And that th the purpose of the driver then is to make sure that the payload, the main bot module, will be injected into the browser address space. And the same, uh, same functionality is implemented by that setup API DLL, which was dropped into the browser, uh, browser directory. So this duplicity backup mechanisms implemented by the malware. And, I, and while I've uh, described this architecture all around, all around the malware, the installation, and the self-protection techniques that it's using, uh, the main thing, obviously, that it's using, since it's a, uh, since it's a bot, is uh, the main module. And uh, here, here the techniques are, are pretty obvious. It contacts the remote server, requests some additional malware to download and execute. And uh, just to highlight uh, quite, a, quite an interesting technique that this uh, uh, module is using, is that the requests that it's uh, using that it's building up to contact the CNCs, uh, they're, they're building up with some junk values. So there would be the, the target URL, either from the URL list encrypted in the registry, or s it has alternatives embedded inside the binary. And then there will be some parameters and values, standard delimited. 
and the number of these parameters is not fixed actually it's it's a random uh, random amount from five to nine and one thing that it sends in each case is the bot ID so so the attacker uh, is able to identify uh, the infection but then then uh, additional junk is is added to this HTTP request uh, such as the parameter be one of these strings and others as well and the value is one of these uh, these these have no specific purpose and why is the malware using these well that's to avoid recognizable patterns in the network communication so this is what it looks like in uh, in an illustrated form uh, the client will will send a request to the CNC server which will reply uh, with the with the executable with the other malware such as Carver or Shelder or RDP door for example it's compressed with AP lib and that will be executed on the infected machine and then a status information will be sent whether the installation was successful or not okay quite a lot of statistics uh, included in my presentation uh, here's another one which shows uh, the relative ratio I just wanted to show how much uh, of each of these families that I've just described uh, is out there. Uh, so as you can see over here in the top, the barely visible red and blue colors belong to shell door and RDP door. Now that is not to say that uh, these families are insignificant. These detections are still in the numbers of thousands and people are getting, uh, are having to part uh, with their money uh, thanks to these Trojans, but that is to show uh, how much how much of uh, Hotprot and Carburp is actually out there. So Hotprot, as it's as is the downloader, uh, downloading and infecting other computers and delivering other malware, other banking banking Trojans onto the system, has the greatest share out of all these four families. And I already mentioned the similarity in the installation with uh, TDL. And if you think about it, the functionality reminds me of TDL as well, as well since TDL would uh, infect the system, use pretty advanced uh, rootkit techniques, and then allow uh, other third-party malware to be loaded on the infected system. So I think the question of why we need to pay attention to all this malware, all these families, has been answered during the presentation. I mean, this is, this is, these are tools which the attackers, the criminals, are using to steal money from the victim to steal a lot of money and just to give you an example of how much they're stealing these are these are some numbers from the investigations carried out by group IB these are separate uh, groups which this one was stealing uh, over 24 million dollars over a period of time this these these bad guys were stealing over 26 million dollars and according to the group IB report the global cybercrime turnover for 2010 was seven billion dollars that's quite quite an astonishing number and the share of russian speaking countries out of this horrific figure is over one third now these numbers are for 2010 this report was uh was published this year and it's already already known that uh, in the second half of 2010 uh there has been a, a notice noticeable increase in uh cyber crime related to banking trojans so we're expecting uh, the numbers for 2011 to be even higher, and the report will be out uh, in the first quarter of next year. So to finish off my presentation, uh, as I said, these banking Trojans are used as weapons, and they're targeting, targeting uh, victims globally, but the share of Russian-speaking countries is uh, quite, quite remarkable. And these countries are both the orig origin of, uh, of these Trojans as well as the targets of the criminals. And to say that the solutions uh, would be cooperation is probably a cliche, uh, but it's, it's not only necessary to, com to communicate uh, between uh, peers in, in, in the industry, different Navy companies do this, do this uh, communication all the time, but also different sectors of the security industry uh, such as a AV companies, uh, law enforcement, banks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So while while an, a good antivirus can be thought of as a bulletproof vest, the real solution will be to stop the person shooting. And hopefully, 
if we do it well, we'll be seeing more headlines like this. These, these people uh, were arrested by the Russian police, and this group was actually using the shell door uh, banking Trojan. And among other instances of theft, uh, these guys also stole over $600,000 in a single transaction. That's probably not a very good idea. And also this headline, uh, this guy is uh, pretty famous, Pavel Rublevsky, a major player in the uh, Russian cybercrime business. Uh, we're ma mainly, mainly focusing on uh, rogue AVs, where his uh, company, Chronopay, is the largest processor of the payment, of the online payments, and basically enabling the criminals to cash out uh, from this dirty business. He was arrested this summer. So a big thank you to my colleagues who have a great, uh, great uh, share of work on this presentation, Alexander Matrosov and Eugene Rodionov from ESET and Dmitry Volkov from Group IB. And thanks to you all for attention. <laughs>